Thanks, Adrian, and welcome to our Industry Week webinar, where we're going to be talking about how to improve root cause effectiveness through making the most of evolutions to learning and also supporting technology. In this series of webinars, we're going to talk about some of the different approaches we've found to upskilling operators, whilst keeping them as close to the job as possible. We're also going to highlight the role that mobile technology can play in the world of devices and we'll discuss how routine, rigorous daily management systems can also help to provide very important structures to your root cause training programs. But before we get into that, let's just take a brief look at the history of training to reflect on the experiences many of us have had so we can see how we got to where we are now. In the past, there was apprenticeships. This was a very much a learn and do model. Apprenticeships worked on the job underneath masters where they learned the practical skills of their tasks. It would take many years for them to become a journeyman and from there they may be eventually able to progress to be master craftsmen. This took quite a bit of time and relied on sufficient masters being in the business and there was also no guarantee that workers would understand why they were doing what they'd been told to do. To address the why question, classroom training was introduced. Most of you have probably learned your initial professions this way and many industries introduced cadetships or internships. The model included long blocks of time away from work, formal exams to check that students understood theory and often lots of general learning. When I joined the steel industry 24 years ago, it was standard practice for us to learn through a cadetship model. Our mechanical and electrical trades initially spent one year working on tools in a workshop where they practiced their craft before being allowed to work with craftsmen on the actual steel factory floor. They then completed another three years of uh, university studies before being finally released out onto the plant to drive root cause analysis. The operators were put straight onto the factory floor but they were buddied up with skilled operators who were numerous at the time and they served many years in the junior ranks before eventually progressing to more senior roles. Training departments back then were well resourced with lots of internal facilitators skilled in running all of the required core training and as technology evolved, these training teams looked to see how they could automate some of their learning, which leads us to the next type of training, the computer-based training. Self-paced instruction was introduced and often delivered through software packages at all times of day and night. It allowed instruction to be done away from the workplace without direct involvement of a teacher and large numbers of people could be trained. However, there was no guarantee that the trainee absorbed the information or even that the trainee was watching the screen at the time. It was simply another form of book learning. Many of you have probably experienced this type of learning. It's frequently associated with compliance type activities like inductions or cyber security um, or possibly as introducing a base level of knowledge for our teenagers as they're starting to get their learner's license before being allowed out into the big wide world of driving vehicles. <coughs> Well, well, thank you for that, Belinda, and thank you for putting that image for uh, those of us that have teenagers with driver's licenses. That's a little scary thought. Um, so we can get a, a little bit of some background information around our audience. We'd like to insert a poll here and have you answer a question. So, so take a few minutes uh, and, and think about this. What, what was your primary method to gain knowledge and experience relevant to your profession as you've come up? Uh, has it been formal training in the classroom, on the job experience? some sort of college or technical education class, uh, apprenticeship model, or an internship, as Belinda has mentioned, or, or others. So if, you, if you'd pick one of those uh, and, and hit submit, we're going to come back to those answers in just a little bit. So I'll give you a, a, a few seconds to think about that and, and pick your primary method. All right, uh, so let, let's, let's move forward. <clears throat> you know, in, in today's world, it, it's a little different. We are expected to have uh, plants operations up 24-7, and the expectation is 100% utilization or, or pretty close to that. Uh, we, we've also moved away from, from giving people that long extended timeline to get comfortable, to get good at what they do, and we expect them to be proficient much quicker. Right? They, they come online and they're expected to be able to handle their jobs within a, a few weeks, not a few years uh, now. Right? Uh, and they've moved into more roles of, of almost monitoring looking at data that's coming into control rooms, monitoring how the machine is performing. Sometimes the machines correct themselves. They make adjustments based on, on, on data and information that's coming in. Uh, the, the, the employees, the, the poor, the shop personnel, the operators have moved almost to a, a more oversight role 
Um, all that good information coming in, all that automation, sometimes things still go wrong uh, and people need to be involved and they need to do some live troubleshooting and some live problem solving, right? Um, so when that happens, uh, that's what we're focusing on here is to explore how to develop those skill sets and what we call uh, micro learning, small bites uh, of knowledge uh, and how to get people up to a certain expected level of performance quicker so they can react better, so they can do better root cause analysis, and how to build those things into your daily routines. How do we build that into how we run the plant on a daily basis? Uh, because the, the expectation is to get those machines back up, get those things running, because we have that expectation of high performance. So that's where we're going to focus uh, most of our, our efforts today. Right? The, the, the structures that we're going to give you, we're going we're to reference several structures repeatedly. Right, we're going to give you a structure that can improve your root cause effectiveness, uh, which basically Im improves those, those measures that we all look for. High uptime, improved quality, uh, increased shipping on time, all those things that we're familiar with. Right, we'll talk about ensuring an assist a consistency in approach. Right, so everybody sort of thinks along a similar path, acts a, a similar way. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to reduce the time for the on-the-job learning. Um, so... Let's uh, let's go ahead and, and get back to the pool and or the poll, excuse me, uh, and take a look at how most of you uh, ha have learned. Thanks, Chris. Oh, look at that! Yep. Uh, we have a great deal of on-the-job experience learning we as you do. go. I must yeah. say that's um, that's I guess the history and the experience that both you and I have had, and indeed many of the folks that we work with in industry today. Uh, We've got a, a decent chunk there at the college and the technical education, not so much on the formal uh, training and, and I guess the apprentices not so much either, which uh, is very much a, a, almost a dying model I would say these days. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, look, we can see obviously if we've got that on-the-job learning experience, we must have a great depth of experience out there in our audience. And, and I'm going to hazard a guess that in fact some of us have probably been in industry for a while, uh, just as KT has. In fact, we're celebrating our 60th anniversary this year. Uh, so just a little background on us before we dive into the details. We developed the train the trainer concept uh, back in, in uh, the 50s when we were pioneering that critical thinking and we've been applying these concepts across industries focusing on not only delivering training but also making sure that that training delivers results as that's where our customers uh, started to push us to make sure that was happening and today we operate in both the training and consulting space. Um, we are pretty excited to be working into this new century though where we're focusing on the realities of today's learner environments. Uh, as I indicated, I joined the industry uh, initially in steel um, quite some time ago and I joined KT about 15 years ago because I enjoyed seeing root cause analysis in steel so much I wanted to see how it applied across multiple industries. The reason I've stuck around is because I see these root cause skills applied at the front line so effectively to enable learners to not only be promoted faster than their peers, but also to achieve those great business results. So back to you, Chris. Thanks, Linda. Um, you know, it's interesting. I spent the first third of my career, and I was the guy with the stopwatch and the clipboard trying to convince people I wasn't watching them work. I hated that job because it was a headcount exercise, and there was no consideration of why people did things the way they do or how we were going to make their jobs easy or better and more productive. It was, you need six people to do this, you have ten. That was not developing the organizations at all. Uh, as I've worked with KT for the last 12 years, what I've found is that the concepts that we're talking to you about around implementation and sustainability and, and understanding why people work that way they do, they apply to many different industries. I have made toilets by hand in Texas, and I have seen um, uh, semiconductors built uh, up in Upper New York, state. So regardless of how complex or how different your industry is, these concepts will apply uh, across your industries. It's been quite an eye-opener for me. All right, so I spend a lot of my time, in, and as does Belinda, in implementation. How to make these things stick, right? Uh, and, and the general concepts, these pillars of implementation that we talk about, how to become really effective at root cause analysis, right? There are four things that we're going to talk about, and we'll hit this model repeatedly. The first one is the, the learning, is the capability transfer. Right? How do we know what we're supposed to do? 
Uh, the, the second pillar that, that helps support that is, is the coaching on the job. So are you doing it right? Uh, and what does good look like? Uh, and then we talk about process integration. So instead of establishing root cause as, as a separate thing, right, how do we make it part of how we do business every day? That's, that's the business process integration part. And then the, the, the performance system uh, integration, uh, that, that is how do we make it non-punishing? How do we make people want to do this stuff on their own because they see value in it? All right, those are the things, all those things done well together leads to root cause effectiveness uh, in the organization. Great. So what is this micro-learning exactly, Chris? Well, that's a, a really good question, Belinda. Um, you know, there, there are lots of terms and lots of buzzwords that, that come out that, that are a little confusing, but this one's pretty straightforward, right? Micro-learning is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's bite-sized pieces of easily digestible information or, or skill transfer. We give you a little bit at a time, basically. Um, and then the, the idea behind that is you build a, a strong base of common knowledge that everybody has, and then as you need it, you pull bits and pieces uh, and apply those as you go. So I'm not giving you the, the whole dinner at once, right? I'm, I'm giving you little bits and pieces. We'll start you off with a little soup and then a little entree and then a little dessert. All those things come together to form the meal, and you eat. I'm, I'm heavy on metaphors. You eat as much as you want, right? Um, the, the key is uh, letting or getting the learner to recognize how much they need uh, and getting them to want to pull that uh, as, as they need it. A great example of this is, you know, I'm sure everybody's done this. You buy a new piece of electronics, and nobody reads the 112-page the manual. Usually you read the six-page startup guide. Let's get this TV on. Let's get this started, right? And then as you want to find out the higher functions, you pull, and you learn bits and pieces as you go. That's the, the benefit of micro-learning. Great, but uh, you know Donald Rumsfeld had this quote around the whole: "It's it's the unknown unknowns which will get you." So, how do we work with that? You know, people needing to pull in the first place if they don't know what they don't know. Yeah, um, you know that that's one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's about figuring out what you what you don't know, um, and then getting that information. Another one of my favorite quotes, and, and it's a little bit humorous, so so bear with us. But I, I find this to hit my Sweet spot, or sweet spot, excuse me, in terms of how I learn, right? So this is from Will Rogers. There are three kinds of men. The ones that learn by reading, the ones who learn by observation, and, and then this, this last one is me. Uh, the rest of them have to pee on the electric fence for themselves and figure that out. So while that is funny, uh, the reason it applies to me is I, I can read a book and I get it, and I can watch somebody do it and I get it, but I don't internalize it. I don't learn until I try it, and, and I get shocked a little bit by doing it wrong, and then I learn. Uh, and then maybe I, I get a little better, uh, right? That, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, Micro-learning is that we get to try things, we get to practice things without the risk of getting hurt, basically. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, I'm going to show you a couple pictures, and, and they kind of illustrate my, my point here about levels, right? Uh, a lot of you have probably called a call center, or, or a lot of you probably have is issue escalation processes in your organizations. There are different levels of support. And to assume that every level of support is the same type of interaction or needs the same type of information is just wrong, right? That, that's not the way it is. But within each of these levels, everybody has a vital role to play. Now, typically, the levels look something like this. Maybe level one is operators, right? And they're the first responders, and they, they monitor the alarms. They gather the information. They put boundaries around the issue. They ask those first important Key questions, and they may take some actions to resolve, and maybe that's as far as it needs to go. Or, or they may take some actions to gather more information, and maybe it gets elevated because it's not easily resolvable, right? And then you get into level two. So it moves up a level. Um, you know, the first level are, are your operators, your maintenance guys, your, your um, lab techs, etc. Then it gets elevated to level two. Level two are your team leaders, are, are your shift supervisors, maybe some plant engineering staff, right? Some some mid-level maintenance guys. And they have a little more knowledge about what's going on. They're still on the floor. They're still involved in day-to-day -day operations. Uh, so they still have a lot of knowledge about what's going on day-to-day, -day, what's changed since the night before, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they bring a little more rigor to the conversation, right? And then if it doesn't get solved by level two, then usually it gets elevated to level three. Level three are your, are your site management. They're, they're your, your mechanical engineers, your process engineers, your subject matter experts. 
and they're applying some sort of full-blown, very rigorous problem-solving process to these issues. You don't need the same level of exposure to these tools at each of those issues. Right? Level one might just be gather and, and, and take some containment action. Level two, you're into some, some basic problem solving, and level three is the full, the full approach, right? full rigor around this. Um, so you need, that, that's one thing we keep in mind about how we expose people to these tools. That's fantastic. Thanks, Chris. I, I love that image. And, and also, you know, I really love that role of the level two leader. I mean, one of the successful hallmarks of a truly successful level, level two leader is, is that monitoring for recurrence, right? You know, they're, they're on that shop floor often enough to be able to look for those types of events that they need to dig into. So let's look back to our audience and, and let's get a bit of a, a, a view. Uh, we should have a poll showing up here on the screen in just a moment. And we'd like you to select uh, the top, um, I guess, skills or, or capabilities or actions which you find your level one, your first responders need from a skills uh, point of view. So I think uh, we've got the option there to select about three of those radio buttons. Chris, is that correct? Yep, that's correct. So if you take a minute and, and, and pick your top three. <clears throat> so. I started to talk about this in the last slide. The, the key here is to understand what your needs are at each of those levels. Like what are the expectations around your problem solving? And you train people on the tools, on the expectations, on the performance that you're looking for here. Right? That's the key when you're designing any, any sort of engagement or skill development uh, around this. Um, so, Belinda, I, I quoted my favorite cowboy. I think you have a different quote in mind. To move us forward. In, indeed I do. So uh, I'm going to go with Einstein um, and we're going to talk about how do we change that knowledge of, of training uh, into actual experience. So to, uh, if we're going to do some micro learning, we really haven't given these guys an awful lot of skills. Uh, so let's talk, turn to the uh, Australian Air Force to look at how they do that. Now certainly in Australia we don't have the same sort of capacity as, as the US military might, but we do spend a little bit of money on, uh, on some of our aircraft and we want to make sure that it's looked after. So at 120 million Aussie dollars, this RAF F-35 strike fighter is a pretty big investment for us. Um, the stealth capabilities of it mean that it's got to be flown very differently to the old uh, F-18 Hornets that it replaced. And uh, our pilots need to master all sorts of new competencies, but uh, you know, how can we let pilots fly such an expensive and, and you know, frankly pretty dangerous machine if they haven't got that kind of experience. So you know, in the military and in commercial aircraft as well, about 40%, 50% of uh, the initial training flights on all these aircraft are actually done on simulators. Pilots spend hours um, and hours training for all sorts of air-to-air -air missions and that greatly reduces the risk. So our answer to that, right, is a simulation. Uh, it's an exercise where you get the practice, but you don't hurt anything, right? Um, so, so what we have developed, it's a, a, a mechanical simulation, and there are different scenarios that models typical industrial manufacturing or IT problems with a Lego Mindstorm robot. I don't know if any of you have seen these things, but they're really very, very fun to play with. So I, I regress to when I'm eight when I use this stuff. Um, it, it's computer-based problem simulations, and it fits nicely into the, the, the KT problem-solving processes that we talk about, right? It, we, we teach you a little bit, and then we give you a chance to practice. Uh, it's it, it's a re the, probably the most realistic simulation I've seen. It's a safe environment where you don't hurt anything if you make mistakes. It, it lets you look for data. You interact with people in different positions. Uh, you sometimes interact from different locations, and you learn to use just enough of the problem solving processes to be successful. That, that's really the focus of these simulation efforts. Um, so basically, when we're, when we're doing this and as we incorporate it into the KT mini workshops, right, we learn bits and pieces in small chunks. Um, as, as each area is covered, then we use these realistic simulations to reinforce those problem solving concepts. It, it's hands-on hands -on practice exercises or scenarios um, as I said, people get to experience failure or success based on, on how they approach it, uh, and, and, and then we have small debrief sessions. So it's let's talk about as a group uh, how that went for you. Was it hard finding the information? How did you apply maybe some, some partial information? What worked? What didn't work for you? And then that reinforces the learning. And then we repeat that loop. We go back into 
some smaller learning. We practice, we coach, we debrief, uh, and that's how we apply this within the confines of, of our workshop, right? And that gives us some real-world application experience around these. Fantastic. So that's that's a really interesting demonstration of a, a solution, I guess, that the, the KT team have been using. Uh, now, I'm sure many of you um, on, on our call today have probably got similar opportunities in your workplace where you've been using simulations or perhaps where you're exploring uh, using simulations. In the old days, it was a, a role play and uh, you know, these days we've got excellent opportunities with apps that are easy to develop and test out concepts. So if you've got a, a your question screen up there, you know, by all means we'd be interested to hear, you know, what your experiences and challenges have been with these simulations. Yeah, they take a bit of effort, so why should we make the effort to uh, get these things set up, Chris? Yeah, you know, this is, this is, I guess you'd call it one of my pet peeves or favorite points. Uh, I was with a client recently, and they said, KT was here five years ago, and I asked them, then why am I back here? You know, some of you had it five years ago. Why am I back here teaching it again? And, and this, this graph kind of shows why, basically, right? We, we give you some skills. Everybody's very excited coming out of the workshop, and they, they want to try it, and, yeah, that's great. Just like any other skill, you don't use it. it doesn't, you don't internalize it, and it goes away. Right? That's, that's the value of having these simulations. It, it gives you some, some chances to internalize it and, and to learn it very well. And we found over experience or over again, yeah, our experience over time has been when you do this kind of stuff, the simulation, the, the application of the skills, the reinforced quick coaching loops, that the competency stays with you much longer and is much higher than if you just do lecture and some practice cases and that's it. Right, so that's why this this particular aspect of the training has become so important. So we don't lose our skill sets quickly; they stay with us, and then we have a chance to internalize them. Wow, that that is really quite interesting. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, Chris. So, how about sure. we go back to that poll and and take a look at what our audience thought about were the key topics? Wow. I like this audience, Chris. <laughs> I like this audience very much. Um, look, yes. <laughs> look at that. Okay, so so we're uh, we're seeing that we need to uh, you know gathering facts around the problem is one of the yeah. highest um, values that we're looking at for those first responders. Uh, and then you know I guess linked to that almost is identifying what a, a clear problem actually is. Um, and clarifying the situation. Wow, look at that. So we've got, we've got an audience that are like, you know, we need to get as much information as we can as quickly as we can before we take some of that action. Um, and, uh, and, and good to see that we're stopping and thinking to take action, in fact, before we take quick action. Wow, very, very cool. Yep. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to some of these questions. All right. So KT um, started with uh, five days of face-to-face -face training back in the 50s for root cause analysis, and, and we eventually moved it to you know three days, um, which we've held our programs at for many, many years. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, Chris and I have been very successful with those sorts of methods, and, and we felt that that was the absolute minimum required to develop competence so that you could return to the workplace and get results. But uh, you know, like many of the folk on this call, I expect, uh, our customers, they challenged us and said, you know, things have changed. Learners are, are doing things differently these days. And so we've been piloting a number of different programs across some different geographies and industries to see whether we can break things down into much smaller, smaller chunks. And uh, like our audience here on the line, you know, the top six that we've got here are the key kind of topics or tiny little bite sizes that we've been fitting into you know, two hour kind of micro learning on the job with the operators, uh, four hour sessions um, uh, supported by things like that simulation and then you know, as, uh, as Chris indicated there's another two pillars which we'll get to shortly which are absolutely critical uh, if we're just going to use these micro learning approaches. So, you know, first up, even identifying that we've got a problem. That's the old Rumsfeld quote of unknown unknowns. So you know, good manufacturing practice still requires that we have standards in place in our organisation. And so having those standards in place so we can identify that there has been a deviation. And of course our smart systems these days will often tell us um, that there's a problem, but we need to be able to interpret what that alarm is. The five whys is that tried and trusted, trusty way of getting ourselves to 
what is the actual problem, uh, which is where our good problem statements will certainly help us. Uh, and then, as our audience called out, getting the facts and, and clarifying what that problem is. Uh, so we've got a bit of describing the problem. Before we start jumping into you know, what might be the causes, but before we take action, stopping and thinking. So we're going to share a bunch of things with you after today's webinar. And some of the things we're going to share is some examples of some templates um, which we've provided to uh, operators after these micro learning sessions to help reinforce just these key little snippets of concepts that we provide for level one. So great to see we've got some good alignment there with our audience, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just so you guys don't know why, Belinda and I were so excited about those answers. There have been many times that I've spent a day, day and a half facilitating some problem, and we realize that the problem statement is wrong or we're at the wrong level. Now that, that taking the time to think up front uh, is pretty important. Right, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is a, a quote that kind of reinforces uh, how important it is to, to commit to the implementation. How do you make it stick, right? As I said, I can, I can read a book, I can know, uh, I can see it done, but until I apply it, uh, just because I want to do it doesn't mean I'm going to do it well. So we've got to make conscious effort to apply, or apply, excuse me, and implement into our organizations. Uh, and Belinda's going to talk to you a, a little bit about what uh, the curriculum looks like around micro-learning. Micro Sure. So this is now getting into the implementation piece, right? And, and each situation will be different. This is an example from a client that we worked with um, where we were upskilling, again, their frontline leaders uh, in a call center. Um, now, we started with an executive briefing, and we'll talk uh, towards the end around why the leadership is so important. So this was briefing the leaders around what to expect, and more importantly, what their role was, before we then launched into these short lunch and learn sessions that were followed immediately by coaching uh, and support to ensure that the skills were used on the job. Those coaches uh, were developed through a, a workshop simulation kind of platform. So you know, they did require that level two uh, leadership. They needed to, to uh, develop some additional skills which would enable them to coach and mentor. So KT played the role of coaching initially, but after we developed those coaches, we then provided the roles of the facilitating and mentoring. And just as Chris said, it's like a menu. So you know, you need to figure out what the topics are and how often you're going to deliver them. So yeah, as you design your program, um, we'll we'll talk about some of the concepts to keep in mind at the end. But have a figure, uh, think about what your resources are and what the key focuses are, and how you can break that into small pieces. Now, once you've got those small pieces broken up, it may be a program that lasts for weeks or months. And uh, you know, the beauty of manufacturing, and we're going to assume that a lot of our audience here, Chris, is a manufacturing base, is that you know, manufacturing right. often has a much shorter cycle than that. It's often a 24-hour rhythm, in fact. And so now what we want to do is we want to make sure that the micro-learning that we're applying over months, we're expecting our operators, our first responders, to use those skills on a daily basis. So this is our daily management system. And if you take a look at the picture that I've got there, let's imagine we're starting with afternoon shift. Uh, and uh, it's an eight hour sort of cycle. So afternoon shift are having their shift handover from day shift. And we've got a level one meeting, which is where our first responders are talking to each other and they're talking to the tradesmen and they're understanding you know, what issues have occurred and what data they've gathered about it. That's our red square. Uh, their team leaders then get involved and we have a level two meeting where our team leaders are sharing information uh, between both areas uh, and they're identifying potentially some recurring issues uh, and they're helping those troubleshooting um, operators to work through some of the issues which they haven't been able to address. That gets handed over to night shift who repeat the same cycle, a level one and a level two until we get to our day shift which has now got a level one and a level two and here we've got our green sort of hexagon shape, which is our level three meeting. So the idea is if we set the expectations that our operators and our team leaders together are gathering these facts and data, containing um, what they can and using any existing knowledge and experience to rule out causes, by the time we get to our level three meeting, we've got engineers who are able to step in and leverage everything that's been gathered rather than heroes that are coming in with nothing or assuming that our operators have no information and having to start from scratch. 
And you know, that's the sort of drumbeat that we're really looking to implement to ensure that those different elements of the team are performing and we've got our, our people at the top of the pile um, you know, playing the conductor role and escalating getting additional resources as needed. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this is great stuff. As a, as a former uh, musician, uh, you know, the, this, this rhythm, this beat, this, this pattern is very appealing to me. It becomes just part of the way we do things. Uh, and it becomes uh, just standard expectation for people. So I love this stuff. Um, let, let's take a look at, uh, we're going to have another poll for you. Uh, and uh, I, I want you to identify, and these are, uh, you can identify up to three here. Right? What are the biggest challenges around daily reporting, daily routines, tracking uh, of issues, and, and resolution in your environment? So it says select all that apply, but give us your top three. Okay, we're going to move Thanks, on now. Yeah. Yep. As, as I've walked around, and, you know, I've walked around some great factories with some many excellent visual boards in place, and getting the basics established isn't hard, right? But leveraging that structure of those actual meetings to drive accountability of using those root cause skills is what really separates a manager who's managing a leadership system from a leader who is leveraging you know, the knowledge and experience from all levels of the business. That's why daily disciplines alone will seldom lift the site's performance, but it's also equally why root cause training, you know, be it increments of four hours or two hours or even a three or five day program, training on its own will generally be pretty slow to drive results. So if we can put the two together, you'll have the benefit of the people being trained on the job only as much as is needed, but then expecting them to pass those skills off to the next level. So this is one of the key takeaways we wanted to leave with you guys today in terms of when you're doing a root cause training, look at your daily management system and have a look at how you can tighten it to make sure that you are expecting people to use the skills you've trained them in. So the first one, I'll be reporting on the issues which should have been addressed before the meeting. Okay, that's a big one. Often those level one meetings become a communication session. We want our operators instead to come with, I've addressed this one, or I've got the facts around this one, and I need to escalate this one. So is the information being gathered prior to the meeting? And uh, the next question, question three, is all targeted at those level two leaders. So have they identified recurring issues, and are they treating them you know, and identifying them within the confines of that meeting and saying, this one has happened again, rather than just simply accepting the report of a same uh, event over and over. And there's some great visual prompts you can use for that. I've seen some things with strips where they're highlighted red, but it still takes a leader to identify that it's a recurrence. The next step is, again, related to more our level three leaders, and the same with number five, is there an agreed process that people are going to use for root cause analysis? And are our leaders requiring people to use that? Are they stepping up and saying, no, it's not good enough? You haven't brought the information to the meeting. So let's take a look back at that poll and see what some of the challenges were that people had um, with the daily management systems they've uh, been implementing. Okay. Chris, do you want to talk to some of these ones? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the, the first two, the, the access to data and the accuracy of data, not necessarily a surprise to me. We, we hear that one a lot in, in our organizations as people you know, they, they put in great systems and then they put in all these manual forms and automatic measurements and, and sensors on machines, but is that the data that you need? Uh, and, and how accurately, how meaningful is that data? So I, I, I'm not surprised to see that one. Um, interesting, the, the interpretation of information, not everybody understands it the same way. Right? That, that's, that's a little higher than I expected. I've certainly seen that, but uh, we often talk about, is everybody speaking the same language? And I don't mean English or Spanish or whatever, I mean more engineering operations maintenance language. What, what does that information mean to you? So that, that's pretty interesting to me. And, and, and the engagement uh, around the impact or effectiveness. Do people understand why what we're looking at is important? Um, I think that's a big one, right? If people are being asked to do a lot of data gathering and a lot of discussion, but if they don't know why it's important or what you're gonna do with it or how it impacts operations, look, I just run my machine, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, that, that, that's a problem, and that's a big issue. So uh, I, yeah. I, I'm not surprised 
that that is there, uh, and I've seen it a lot, right? Yeah, now, isn't that interesting to see that piece around engagement? So, um, you know, the, the why when we talked about apprentices, uh, we said, you know, one of the gaps with apprenticeships is often people were, were told what to do and not, not explained to them why. And so that's where the idea of some of the training was introduced from a why point of view. I totally get um, this idea that people are perhaps not as engaged in the daily management system, though, because often they walk into it and they see it and they just start following the routines. And no one's taken the time to explain to them why those routines are there. So perhaps that's a sixth point that can get added to those little five points that we put down there, Chris, around has there been an education um, program around your daily management system or are we just expecting people to walk in and follow everyone else and, uh, and we're assuming that they understand you know, why we have it structured in three different levels. Does it match up with the training and so forth that we provide? Right, right. Yeah, I think now, that's a great point. Are, yeah, we, 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 I think we owe these audience. They, they're giving us some great tips. So one of the other things um, that we can also do to increase engagement, and particularly this is with the younger generations, is you know, everyone's attached to their devices these days. Um, and increasingly, um, you know, we've got devices are required as part of our job. You know, we, we don't have the laptops that we plug in anymore to uh, to decode and, and, and polish some of the electrical components. You know, we, the electrical components are talking in Wi-Fi and we can come along with our phone with a cloud-based app and we can troubleshoot it there and then directly with the supplier's uh, troubleshooting information and so forth. So just like uh, the IoT evolving, we can also apply that evolution to our daily management systems. We've got an example here. I'm sure there's some other examples and we're certainly keen to see and hear about them. But KT has partnered with a group called Soft Tools, who provide cloud-based alternatives to factory daily management. What we're looking at here is the same sort of info that can be put onto visual boards, but it's got the added benefit that it integrates into your ERP, so it can source the data directly. Now, it looked like people didn't see that as one of the biggest issues, but it certainly was a part of, uh, of the concerns. Once that data is entered directly, then the operators are able to you know, address that in terms of providing information around the actions that they've taken. They can potentially take some photos. Uh, if it's a good manufacturing audit or a 5S audit, we can require them to take a photo uh, as evidence of the space of the area that they were working within. So we've got some elements of compliance for those of you who uh, uh, require that sort of information. Uh, the reporting is automated, so admin and so forth can be removed out of that. Uh, and you know, the, the question about people interpreting things differently is a great question. You know, often, if you are at those visual boards and you're part of the communication and you can you can hear the discussions that are there, then maybe people are on the same page. But then there's that Chinese whispers because the regional manager or the GM isn't necessarily able to look at that factory board and see the comments that were put up there. But when it's on a cloud platform, people can look at that information real time and see it across different parts of the business. So we really see this as a key part of the future. It's one of the reasons why we've partnered with the group and we're certainly very keen to hear about some of the experiences that others have around turning daily management systems into cloud or you know, technology visual platforms as well as physical platforms out on the plant. Uh, so it's controlling things from the, the phone in your pocket. So um, we, we started off just to refresh around this model that we started discussing, right? We've been talking about the micro learning, the, the capability transfer, and just a reminder that we have the other components that, that support that learning, the coaching, the on the job, Coaching, is that what it's supposed to look like? How are you doing against expectations? The process integration, how do we make this part of our daily routines, our daily management systems, and what does that look like? The performance system integration, how do we make it so it's meaningful for the participants, for the users, right? So all of those things have to happen in order for this to, these root cause efforts to be implemented and be sustainable. Uh, as, as our last poll for you, I'd like you to pick uh, one of these where you traditionally struggle around this. So if you had to pick one of these four pillars around implementation, where do you see your organization traditionally struggling the most? And 
it may not be you know where you've struggled the most it may actually be where you know you do see that biggest opportunity for improvement possibly because technology has changed um, sure. so much or because you know you you see a, a step change opportunity to do things differently yes I shouldn't always assume that opportunity means struggle that's a bad <laughs> It's like peeing on the fence, I think. That's right. I, I, we know, really I, set I the tone for this, didn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Uh, all right. All right. Um, someday, someday later, Belinda, I'll tell you a story about when I was 12 in an electric fence. Um, okay. So we, we've got our last poll uh, under our belt, and we'll go to the results in, in just a minute. Right. And, and uh, <clears throat> so just, just a touch again, just briefly on, on the value of micro learning. Right, the, the premise of, of only providing a fraction or a part of the traditional learning is that people learn better or, or must learn by doing in an environment that supports them and allows them to fail via the simulations, that sometimes it, it's important to learn what you need to know rather than learn everything about that. Um, this, this environment, this, this situation, these, these simulations that we've outlined, uh, this allows us to coach people to success, right? And, providing, talking about clear signals on when to use these tools, right, to use the skills that they, they, they've learned. Um, and this encourages people to embrace these, these tools and become leaders around the use of these tools. Right? That, that's, that's why what we've talked about uh, is important. Um, so uh, one, one more slide, and Belinda's going to talk to you about this uh, and, and sure. questions that you might want to ask. Yep. So, you know, when you're designing your micro learning, uh, keeping in mind that you're really looking to have you know, level one, level two, level three type learning. So the first question we ask is, how are we going to ensure that those trainees use the skills immediately? Have we got some level two folk in the business or a daily management system or something in place to ensure that after they step straight out of that short bite of learning, they're using the skills? And so then how can we provide them only what they need, okay? So that's that, you know, which bit is what they need and how will we coach them? How will we get them support when they need it and how will the coaches and leaders know how to provide it? So what's our triggers to our leaders to perform? Of course, they're going to need some tools and templates and we'll provide you with some examples of those. The third question we can ask there is what technology could be provided to prompt the trainee? One of the things we didn't speak about with that cloud platform is the beautiful thing about a lot of these is you can integrate learning into those systems at the time. So if someone needs to understand what a problem statement is, they can click on a button and it can give them some guidance in the moment if they don't have a coach available. And finally, rather than looking at how are we going to you know, measure success in terms of the whole program, if we're going to break it down into bite-sized learning, let's think about what's that minimum measure of success so that we can really reward trainees quickly and effectively and coach them just to single lessons at a time. That might be identifying the, the key problem or it might be gathering a piece of data. But let's understand what that minimum measure of success is. So we hope these questions, along with the daily management ones, give you some food for thought. And as I said, we'll also share uh, some, some other uh, case studies and templates after this session. So let's take a look back at that poll and see where you guys saw the biggest uh, areas of opportunity. Wow, okay, so pretty evenly split, uh, but definitely I, I guess we can see that that idea of how do we integrate that micro learning into the processes that we've got in the business. So it's uh, very much driving towards that learn and do thinking, isn't it, isn't it, Chris, in terms of give them a little bit, but then integrate it on the job so that people need to learn it, which, you know, when I think about the audience we started with, if we've learnt on the job, now we're looking at using technology and different methods of teaching so that we can integrate on the job. So let's wrap that up with a little bit of a summary then. So, you know, make sure if you are putting together micro-learning with external providers, you work with training providers, you can offer different flexible solutions. Uh, but as you guys have highlighted, we want to make sure that there are processes, in our case we've talked about using daily management disciplines that encourage the use of those skills. And finally, you know, building that troubleshooting capability but doing so in a tiered way so that our people at the front line have you know, the, the foundations, they're able to do the heavy lifting 
and as we work through different levels of the organisation, we've got different capabilities where we're expecting the team to work together. So thanks so much, everyone. We're going to jump into some questions before uh, you know, we, we, we wrap this up with a few final thoughts. So we'll go to the questions. Our first question is when you mention coaches, are they ICF coaches or SME mentors? Do you want to take that, Chris? Sure. Um, so I, I, I'm going to give you a typical consultant answer. Sometimes it depends. Uh, usually it's, it's some sort of combination of both. But when we talk about SME coaches, uh, the, there would be SMEs within problem solving. Right, so it's not a it's not an experienced electrical engineer, but it's a, an engineer that has been doing uh, uh, has gone through problem solving and, and has been successful at it and knows what good efforts look like. Right, that that's more what we have in, in mind around coaches. So it's coaches around the process, whatever process they're using uh, around resolving this issue. That's what we're talking about when we say coaches. So not necessarily Absolutely. technical. Yep. Uh and, and in, as Chris said, it depends. In some cases, we obviously need to have the right technical content. So you know, one of the roles of those level three people is you can either be a technical expert at that level three level, or you can be a manager who knows where to source those technical experts from. So similarly, with a process coach, they should be able to identify when a technical or an SME mentor is needed. Great question. Yeah, it okay, is. I do want to you. add just a bit. Just a bit more to that but, very quickly. There is, there is a formal development process for those coaches. So I don't just take a strong user and say, you're a coach, because there's a absolutely. different technique and there are different skill sets involved there. So we do have our own process around that. Yeah, okay. great point. Okay, and the next question, Belinda, what about situations which cannot be simulated and you are required to act on a real-time situation? And they gave the example of Captain Sullenberg and landing the plane on the Hudson. <laughs> yeah, that's a fantastic one. Now, Chris, you've got a view on that one, I believe. We spoke about this. Yeah, um, you know, look, the, 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 the simulations are designed to be as, as realistic as they can. But to be quite honest, nothing nothing beats going out on your floor, uh, you know, during the class. And, and, or, and actually, after we do the formal coaching development that I, that I talked about, we have a process and we have another class around that. Part of that is, okay, let's, let's take it for a spin. Let's go out on the floor, um, and I'm going to watch you. I'm going to see how you respond, and, and then I'm going to give you some, some tips around how to handle those real-world situations. I always tell people when I, when I develop them as coaches, don't, don't take on situations that are going to bankrupt the business or try to boil the ocean. Take a little, a little piece, a, a, a low-profile issue, uh, something that, that, that you can't afford to make some mistakes on and, and try it there. So, yes, yeah, simulation doesn't replace real-world experience. We, we try to move you into the real world experience by, by us being there with you and helping with that and, and try some real world experiences that aren't going to hurt too much uh, if you screw them up so you get comfortable. Okay, thank you. The next question is, would you please talk a little bit about how to measure the training success? Chris, do you want to start? I do. Um, I was going to throw this, this out there as an answer, but I, I didn't know how much time we had because this is one where I spend a lot of time. Right, uh, people people pay money to put butts in seats for training, and then they get the the response. Well, that really didn't have the effect that we wanted. There are different ways to measure training. Um, you, you can start at the very basic level, the smile sheets and, and the numbers. I, I trained 30 people, and 75% of them said it was good training, and then the food was good, and they liked the content and the instructor. That's all great and good, but you want to go a little higher, right? You move you move up these levels of evaluation. So then you start talking about the skill transfer. Did you get and maintain the skill sets that the training was designed to deliver. That's one question at a higher level that we try to measure and monitor. Another one, and this is where most people perk their ears up, did that training make a difference? So I, I brought in, I'm just going to give you a, a blinded real-world example. Um, our root cause evaluators don't find cause, and we have a bunch of recurring issues. So I'm going to train them all. Okay. Yes, they thought the training was valuable. Great. Yes, they still have the skill sets a year later and our number of recurring issues went down. So that's the ultimate measure or, or the quantif easily, well not easily, the quantifiable measure of was your training successful. So it really depends on who's looking, what proof of, of effectiveness they desire, and how uh, or if you can get it the whole way up to impact on the organization. 
Uh, you can tell I'm excited about that when I was talking fast and getting excited. So that, that's, that, those are the ways that you can evaluate training from smile sheets the whole way up to impact on the organization. Thank you. Belinda, the next question is for you. What method do you use to train coaches to be good at coaching? Yeah, fantastic. So that's, that's a great question. And, and people won't be surprised to hear that it's a little bit similar to, um, in fact, the way that we've talked about initial micro-learning. So we also look at providing some initial teaching, but then we look at putting them in a simulated uh, environment to be able to coach others. Uh, we then also look at how can we integrate into the processes a prompt so that our coaches know very clearly when they need to provide help. So, you know, be it that an operator can put their hand up or, you know, we've again got some smarts in the technology when people start to enter information, uh, there's a prompt that goes, that doesn't look like a very clear problem statement and it triggers a call out to a coach. So, you know, just as in the apprenticeship model where we had apprentices and journeymen masters, we also have the same sort of model with coaches where we've got uh, a sort of trainee coach that we provide concepts around uh, both soft skills, so being able to understand um, what, what uh, ways to encourage people and work with people and that different people have different approaches, but also around technical skills of how to practically intervene in a way that supports uh, the learner. Great question. Okay, the next question, uh, Chris, how deep should you go as far as daily discipline? How about I take that one, Chris? I, I guess yeah. I spend a fair bit of time out on the shop floor space. Um, and it, it's a, perhaps, you know, if, if our, our reader wants to sort of clarify that question, but I'm going to assume that it means, um, you know, how many items uh, should we be driving within that daily discipline in terms of, you know, is, should it be broadly across all aspects of the business or should we just be focusing on a root cause type issues? And it will really depend on what the business is trying to achieve. So if we can identify what the measures are that are the most important um, and prioritise those, and of course, you know, there's many different skills that we can use for that, then like with our micro-learning, start small um, and get success on those small components and then start to broaden and deepen the focus that you're looking for. So always pair it with the capability that's been provided because as we saw from our, our readers and listeners, engaging people in the daily disciplines was one of the biggest challenges we had. Great question. Okay. The next question is how does your training approach mesh with the TWI approach? Chris? So I, I can take this one a bit uh, or, or to give it a shot. I have a little bit of knowledge around this. Um, basically our, our training approach Right um, within within the the training session itself, um, the the training generally goes like this. There's what we call discovery. So we give you a scenario, a practice scenario where you don't know anything, we haven't touched anything, and that gives us a baseline as to how you think, how you approach things. After the discovery exercise, then there's some lecture, there's some concept teaching. Right. So let's go through. Let me let me teach this. Let me show you an example. Uh, right. And so that's the the formal instruction part. Then after that, we give you a practice scenario, most likely not necessarily related to your specific industry because we want you to focus on the skill sets that we're teaching you, not jump to your subject matter expertise and, and jump to cause. So we give you the practice case. And then the, the last part of that is the what we call real world application. So that is where the simulation begins to fit in because that's a way to, to do application. Or the, the other way that we do application is we bring me your problems. Let's, I said we go out on the floor and try it. Let, let's, let's take one of your problem statements, take one of your decisions, and we'll try it. You try it, I'll coach as you work on this with your uh, – with, with, you work on your real-world issues. Right? So that, that, that's during the session. And then as we expand and as we integrate into your business processes and, and your human performance systems, we design specific interactions or, or connections there – to what you already have in place to make it seem seamless and establish the, the skill sets that we've already taught you and you've practiced and you've used on real world stuff into your daily operating uh, methods and methodologies. So that's generally uh, how we approach the transfer of knowledge. I know okay, there, the there are some question. commonalities there. Yep, go ahead. My pardon. Um, is there an online demo available of soft tools? 
Yeah, that absolutely is. So we can we can get in contact with that that person. And as I said, we um, we do have some case studies to share around um, you know soft tools, how it looks, and and how it has um, you know achieved some great business results in in partnership with you know great thinking processes. Okay, and okay. I think we have time for for one uh, one last question. Um, have you ever used a simulation for evaluating candidates for hire? <laughs> I'm going to great my question. The reason we... I'm laughing because that's really interesting. Um, uh, Go, Chris. Uh, Belinda, have you seen have you seen it used for to evaluate candidates for hire yet? I I have seen it used to assess um, coaches for training. So yeah. Um, right. yeah, that's that's a great method. Um, you know, it's obviously I haven't seen it used solely to evaluate candidates for hire. Um, I have certainly seen um, other simulations as part of a hiring process, but certainly not the only method for hiring, but definitely seen it used to assess the best coaches um, for, for uh, you know, ongoing skill development. Yeah, you know, the only okay. other thing I'll add to that is I've seen it, I've seen it used as baseline before and after uh, as an evaluation. So give them a scenario yes. before, kind of like a discovery case that I mentioned. Here's how they handle it. Now we're done training them. Let's give them another case, similar case, and see how they do. That's been particularly that effective the in results, assessing right? the training. Yeah, yeah. Right. right. Okay, I'm afraid at this point we've run out of time, but just to let those of you know who asked questions that weren't answered, you will receive an answer. And I'd like to thank yep. Belinda Bright, Christian Green, and our sponsor, Kepner Traeger. On behalf of Industry Week, have a productive remainder of the day. Thank you so much, folks. You know, you've got a great proven model for trying, um, you know, doing your skill development. It can be risky to take on a new approach, but uh, we hope that you've found some good ideas around how you can not only shortcut good processes that you've got using things like technology and different thinking, but to maximise the learning and engagement of all levels of your business. Thank you. Yep, thank you all.